Welcome, my dear students and others, to my continuing coverage of Chapter 9's discussion on the molecular geometry and bonding theories of molecules molecularly molecularly. To begin this lecture video, I would like to share some more hilarious chemistry cats from quickmeme.com. This one says, tell a potassium joke, K. Okay. And this one says, do I know any jokes about sodium? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Oh, that one just kills me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, <sighs> okay. So before going on, I also wanted to share a fun video with you, or a collection of some fun videos that I'll link to in the description below and floating over my head, possibly as in-video cards. So there does exist an age-old chemistry demonstration called Elephant's Toothpaste, which features the chemical reaction shown here being catalyzed by potassium iodide. With soap and food coloring added, it makes for a really awesome visual display. And I should mention, don't try this at home because you'll get hydrogen peroxide all over the place and it makes a real big mess. Anyway, here are the links. They're also in the description below. Please click and enjoy, because they're really fun. And I think one of them's in German. All right, so continuing from what we discussed in our previous video that's going to be linked to somewhere, atoms from period three, that is row three of the periodic table and below, actually can be surrounded by more than four electron pairs. That is, they can have more than an octet of electrons sometimes. Now, this creates some fascinating molecular geometries that are a little, that are a little different from the standard ones shown in tables 9.1 and two of our textbook that is referenced in the description below. So if we look at these, you can see this is table 9.1, in which you can see the standard geometries for molecules that typically have only octets around them. You have linear geometries with bond angles of 180 and two electron domains around that central atom. As you get to three electron domains, you can have a trigonal planar electron domain geometry with, with bond angles of 120 degrees. And as you get four electron domains, that is four things around your central atom, you're now in a tetrahedral geometry with ideal bond angles of 109.5, as I discussed in my previous video. Continuing table 9.1, Point one from our text though, you can see that as you get larger numbers of electron domains that now exceed an octet around that central atom, you get more exotic geometries. Trigonal bipyramid right here with bond angles of 120 between each of the groups around the equator and 90 degrees between the orbitals up top and down bottom and that equator. As well as octahedral that has six surrounding groups all separated by 90 degrees. By the way, we call this one trigonal bipyramid because if you draw it out, as has been shown right here, it looks kind of like two pyramids. That is a bipyramid with a triangle base instead of a square base like the pyramids in Egypt. So you have a triangle base with two pyramids, one up top and one down bottom. Hence, we call it a triangle bipyramid or trigonal bipyramid. Isn't that fun? All right, so here are some pictures taken from our text of various molecular geometries. And as it turns out, there is a difference between electron domain and molecular geometries that I'll explain forthwith. Before getting to that though, I must introduce you to some geometry vocabulary. Our book likes to call lone electron pairs, non-bonding pairs, or sometimes just lone pairs. These of course contrast with electrons that are shared between two bonding atoms. Those are called bonding pairs. So you have bonding pairs. Those are essentially represented by a line or bond between two atoms in a Lewis structure and non-bonding pairs, sometimes just called lone pairs that are represented as dots on an individual atom. Now the number of things which could either qualify as lone pairs or other groups or atoms around a central atom is called that atom's number of electron domains, as I just kind of alluded to in table 9.1. Furthermore, as I foreshadowed in an earlier video, linked to in the description below or floating over my head, for molecules that have lone electron pairs, again called non-bonding pairs in our book, I like to just call them lone pairs, you can create two different shapes or geometries, one that counts the lone pairs and one that does not. So the geometry that counts the lone pairs in the overall shape is called the molecule's electron domain geometry, while the one that does not count the lone pairs is called its molecular geometry. To showcase this, we go to table 9.2 from our text. So if you've got a linear geometry where that central atom is surrounded or flanked by two atoms, then its overall geometry looks like this and it, its shape is linear. This is its molecular geometry. So because the first line is so simple as to be boring, I'm gonna skip down to the second line, a trigonal planar electron domain geometry. Okay, so check this out. Imagine you've got an atom that is surrounded by three other atoms, like BF3 right here. If you draw all of those atoms out around that central boron, its geometry or shape is trigonal planar. But what if you have a different molecule that's kind of similar, except instead of being surrounded by three atoms, it's surrounded by two atoms and a lone pair, like this nitrite ion. What's its geometry? 
Well, if you count the lone pair in the overall shape, its geometry looks exactly the same. It's trigonal planar, that is, three things around your central atom. But what if you masked or covered up the orbital containing this lone pair? What would the overall shape look like after that? Yeah, it wouldn't look quite the same because it would only have two things showing. That overall shape, called the molecular geometry here, would be bent. You see the difference? Again, electron domain geometry shows us all of the things around the central atom, both lone pair orbitals and other atoms. Whereas for molecular geometry, we keep the shape the same. We just cover up the orbitals that have lone pairs on them and then name the shape of everything that's left over. Ready for some more? Looking at a tetrahedral electron domain geometry, you might have a situation like methane, where you have a central carbon atom surrounded by four atoms. Really straightforward molecular geometry, tetrahedral, not a big deal. But contrast that with ammonia that has one lone pair on its central atom. Well, that molecular geometry looks like this. And its name is a little bit different because for the molecular geometry, we look at the shape that remains if we cover up that lone pair orbital. And what does that look like? Well, it kind of looks like a single pyramid with a triangle base. Hence, we call it a trigonal pyramid. And its three hydrogen atoms for NH3 right here are all puckered down because that lone pair orbital does take up room and it pushes those hydrogen atoms down. It still has an overall electron domain geometry of tetrahedral, but a molecular geometry of trigonal pyramid. Now compare that with this one, H2O, that has two lone pairs on its central oxygen atom. Yeah, you see that its overall electron domain geometry is exactly the same as all of the others. It's got a central oxygen atom surrounded by four things, hence it's tetrahedral. But its molecular geometry, that is the shape that remains if you cover up these lone pair orbitals, yeah, that is a bent shape. Isn't that great? Now, just so you know, lone pairs and the orbitals that they're in take up a little bit more room than non-lone pair groups. Thus, the bond angles between the hydrogens in this molecule right here, those hydrogens end up being closer together by about two degrees than the ideal 109.5 for a tetrahedron. And over here in H2O, you've got two lone pairs that take up even more room. So the bond angle between the two hydrogens, the two non-lone pair groups, ends up being shortened by two additional degrees down to about 105 relative to the ideal 109.5 for a tetrahedron. Make sense? Good. We get some more exotic electron domain and molecular geometries when we go to five electron domain groups, which you can compare and scan down here. And I invite you to pause the video here and take a look at each of these and consider their names. This one is kind of fun, the seesaw. The reason it's called that is because if you can imagine these two spheres being like feet, if you built a physical model of that and laid it down, you could put yourself on one of these seats and a friend on the other, and it would be just like a seesaw or teeter-totter. And this one is called T-shaped because it's shaped like a T. How imaginative. Then, if you go on to six electron domain geometries, that is the octahedral world, you get the variety shown right here. I don't know why, but I really find square planar fascinating. I just, I like the name. I think it looks kind of like toy boomerang. I don't know. I think it's pretty neat. This background then brings us to a beautiful lecture problem. For water, H2O, please determine each of the following things. And then, using water's geometry as an example, please explain the difference between electron domain geometry and molecular geometry. Now, if it's any help, I'm going to have a link in the description below to a separate video in which I answer some, if not all, of these questions, which takes us to our final question for this video. Please draw a Lewis structure for each of the following molecules or ions and then indicate their electron domain and molecular geometries. As per usual, I invite you to try this on your own and then you can click the link in the description below, which will take you to a separate video in which I do some of these. Not all, but some of them for you. Until next time, my wonderful students and others, please have an enjoyable rest of your day.